That's a charm. <clears throat> we have got this going. Here we go. All right, everybody. Um, my name is Vince Pangin. I am with NetWoven here. I'm going to be um, hosting this webinar. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen. Somebody can send me a message in the chat window if you cannot. Um, all right, I got a message in the chat already. Let's just make sure. Right one. Yes, we can see. All right. Thank you very much, Will. <clears throat> okay, we are recording this webinar here, and so I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware of that. And we're going to do a little bit of an analysis and deeper dive into um, Power Apps and Power Automate um, and Nintex, kind of explore some of the differences and similarities between them and kind of help people make some informed decisions. You know, this is something that you're looking into going forward. <clears throat> Our agenda today, we're going to have a quick introduction of myself and um, the companies, and we're going to do some feature comparisons between the Power Platform and Nintex, and we're going to look at some of the pricing and the licensing uh, comparisons. Uh, we're going to go over some real use case examples that we have done, uh, worked with with clients, uh, both using Power Apps, Power Automate, and also with uh, Nintex Forms and Workflows. And uh, then we're going to go through kind of a wrap up and a summary and then have a little bit of um, a discussion if we have time and also uh, talk about how uh, we can continue to provide services further, um, whether it's on the Nintex way or Power Platform way. Okay, so a quick introduction to myself. My name, as I said, is Vince Hangen. I am an engagement manager and a Nintex solutions architect uh, with NetWoven. Uh, based out of sunny San Diego, California. And NetWoven is um, one of the partners for Nintex and Microsoft. We are a consulting firm uh, based out of um, the Bay Area. We have some employees over in Boston. We have some of our team members in Los Angeles, and we have some uh, extensive developers um, over um, offshore in Bangalore and Kolkata. And of course, they leave me out of this slide because I'm a new guy in San Diego. Uh, we have worked with hundreds of customers, um, some of the Fortune 1000, Fortune 500. You know, we do a lot of this uh, work within the Microsoft stack, whether it's custom development, uh, migrations uh, in and out of Office 365. And as you can see, we are gold partners in numerous um, uh, different competencies. So diving in. Uh, we're kind of going to talk about a quick overview on just what is Power Apps and Power Automate and what are Nintex Forms and Workflows. I'm sure a lot of you probably already have some idea, but we're going to, you know, just kind of do a recap in case there are people who uh, just kind of hearing about it for the first time or aren't quite sure exactly what it is that we're speaking of. Now, um, Power Apps and what used to be called Flow, but is now Power Automate, as you all know, this is kind of the Microsoft offering as far as um, UI uh, development and workflow and automation, you know, systems. Um, Power Apps is a cloud-based platform. This is how you can create some applications, whether it's forms, uh, some dashboarding things or reports, kind of some very, uh, very neat and very powerful things that you can create that run either within your Office 365 tenant or it's actually, you know, standalone um, now, but can tie in and connect really well uh, with your Office 365. Um, and we say that because a big part of it is that it is included, there is licensing that is included uh, with their Office 365, so we will go over that later. And Power Automate was previously known as Flows, and it's just another, you know, cloud-based uh, workflow engine that you can visually create these workflows and connect to other systems and uh, uh, provide some um, detailed levels of, of automation, uh, connecting all your different disparate platforms and applications. Now, Nintex, which is one of the partners, you know, we are one of the partners here at NetWoven, so this is what the comparison is about. They are a company that creates uh, an entire suite of process automation um, tools and just process management tools, but it all started with workflows and forms, um, which was the bread and butter since uh, back in the day when it was all based from SharePoint. So Nintex workflows, now they also uh, provide a, a very powerful workflow engine and there's a few different flavors of it because it can be uh, Nintex that runs with your SharePoint in the, on the on-premise on environment, whether that's still 2013, 2016, 2019. And they also have Nintex Workflow Cloud, 
which is a platform agnostic, just independent uh, workflow engine that connects to um, many different systems um, that has connectors that you can just drag and drop in. It's again, a very uh, powerful engine. And when you use Workflow Cloud, you are not tied in um, to any one system in particular, such as uh, with SharePoint or Office 365. And there is also an text for Office 365, which is tied in again to you know, kind of your SharePoint online and the rest of your Office 365 environment. Now, Nintex Forms is one of their, their UI options that comes with, uh, with your Nintex workflows, and it's basically a very uh, easy way to create some beautiful responsive forms, um, whether they, it is in Office 365 or SharePoint, where these forms are going to be kind of tied to your you know, SharePoint list items or your document libraries uh, individually, or if you're working within Nintex Workflow Cloud, then these um, forms are just tied more to you know each uh, workflow instance and it's a way to, to collect and gather data to kind of trigger these workflows and, uh, and work on them as you go along. Now, when you're sitting here and you know taking um, just making a decision about which which way you want to go, you know there's a lot of things you want to consider. Um, one, of course, would you know be the, the feature comparison. What can one do that the other can't do? Uh, what are the limitations that you're gonna that you're gonna come across and if they have any? Um, and then you're also going to want to uh, think about the complexity of creating and developing, you know, these apps or these workflows and these forms. Uh, do you have some technically skilled uh, developers available or are you going to be working mostly with power users who kind of, you know, know their way around or can figure stuff out? You know, these are really important things to think about. Um, another one is the licensing costs. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, so you have to really think about how much it's going to cost you to do the things you want to do. Now, we're going to talk into this a little bit more detail later because uh, but one big thing people think about is, oh, yeah, you know, you have this, some stuff is included off 365, it might be free, why wouldn't we use that? Um, like I said, you know, everything has, has its catch, and we're going to go over all of those uh, limitations later. And uh, another thing that you really would want to think about is how does this uh, choice now fit into the bigger overall picture? Um, process automation, workflows and forms, you know, it's a, it's a big step, but it can also be little apps. But how does this fit in with the big picture of where your company is going, where you want your, you know, process management to go? Um, are you just trying to create one big application for one single purpose? Or are you thinking about multiple workflows? Is it um, going to improve business process beyond just workflows, whether that's just, you know, the management um, of all your business processes. Um, and we'll explain some of the ways that, you know, some of these tools can work um, in that space. All right. On to the good stuff. So feature comparison. Now, you know, these... Uh, platforms are are very powerful. There's a ton of things they, that they can do, and, and we're not going to get uh, super deep into the, the nitty gritty of, of every little technical aspect, but we're going to, you know, kind of touch over some basic things. We're going to do some quick uh, demonstrations so you can get a, a feel of, of how they work and, and kind of how they operate, and um, you can just think that you'll extrapolate it from there. You know, the more complex and bigger you're going to get. Um, the more you're going to have those kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on, on the general level, when we're talking about Power Apps and we're talking about Nintex Forms, you know, some of their similarities. I mean, you're you're creating in browser-based designers, right? There's no um, desktop app that you ever have to install for all of these, so it's always available wherever you're at, as long as you have access to the internet. You know, it's all in the cloud. Uh, both of these applications allow you to create some very uh, dynamic forms. Um, they all have options for being responsive, so you know, it doesn't matter what kind of device you're looking on. Um, they all have different you know, ways to view them on mobile, you know, mobile apps for Power Apps and mobile for, for Nintex. Uh, they all connect to these external sources um, and also have the option to tie into SharePoint uh, list items. And I know you're going to hear that a lot, and again, we're going to we're going to emphasize that both Power Apps and Nintex have their own standalone um, versions, which aren't really uh, necessarily tied into SharePoint. But uh, we're going to keep bringing it up because that is kind of a big uh, a thing that both uh, both platforms do, right? And and you can see really the, the power in that just by the fact that SharePoint gives you the back end, gives you a platform uh, where you uh, the portal where you can do a lot of the, um, let's say, dashboarding and reporting and just data management, document management without having to 
create that externally as well. Um, but they can also stand alone uh, using their own kind of, you know, data storages if you're not going to be relying on SharePoint for that. And they all have different ways of uh, using rules based in kind of engines for, for making dynamic, not even just forms, but just UIs. Now, some of the, the differences right off the bat when you think about it is that, you know, when you're working with Power Apps, uh, it doesn't, I'm sorry, this is kind of misleading when I say it requires a SharePoint online, but if you're using the, the SharePoint integration uh, with it, you can, you're going to need to have the SharePoint online unless you're going to um, have a, a data gateway, which is just a little bit more um, level of complexity because it takes you to a different uh, pricing level, as opposed to Nintex, it has versions for SharePoint online as well as SharePoint um, on premise. And when we get into licensing, you'll see that when you buy, you know, packages or workflows, it, it doesn't matter which which version you're using. They all they all count towards the same um, bucket. Um, now, the Power Platform likes to use a lot of formulas. I, I say Excel-like because it's kind of a way that people can relate it to things that they might have done before in the past. You can create some functions in Excel, and we've ever done that. You know, that you can really get uh, pretty intense and pretty powerful with that. But you know, a lot of the uh, things that you'll do in, in Power Apps, you're going to find yourself creating these big uh, formulas um, to do some of the more complex, you know, uh, calculations or things that you're trying to figure out. Uh, now, Power Apps, I also like to use uh, a lot of the programming notation. Uh, and I say this coming from a you know developer background in the past. It's it's something dot something when you're talking about properties, and you know this is great when you know what exactly what you're talking about, but um, I think we found that a lot of people who haven't been exposed to this before, you know, it's although it seems pretty straightforward, it can cause some confusion later. Um, but again, it's just a, a preference and it's a learning curve that comes with it. Uh, Power Apps, you do require licenses for your users if they're going to be just, you know, consuming and using the app. Um, and they do have uh, in preview mode right now the ability to have like guests. Uh, users from other organizations. So if you create Power Apps in your, let's say your Office 365 tenant, and you have a guest in your tenant from other organizations, they can use those Power Apps, but you do need to assign them uh, one of your Power Apps licenses. So I know it is coming in the future that they will be able to bring their own licenses over um, from you know their own tenant if they have Power Apps over there. But right now it's only kind of in the preview mode still. Um, and you have to be able to assign them one of your own licenses. Um, again, some things just to keep in consideration. But, um, and one thing that Power Apps does nicely is that, um, and we'll show this a little bit later, is that you know, they have a little bit more functionality as far as uh, providing their, their UIs aren't so much limited to just single list items. You can uh, create some apps that, that do much more, such as you know, manage entire uh, lists or display entire lists of data and kind of go through them uh, one at a time to kind of provide more of the um, full app functionality uh, as opposed to just more of a form for single list items. And so, yeah, Nintex forms, and we talked about that, you can have versions for SharePoint online and on-prem. So a lot of times this might be a big, um, a big difference maker if you happen to be using on-premises versions of SharePoint. Uh, their forms are created with drag and drop, very easy to create these responsive, really nice looking forms, and we'll show that later as well. Uh, most of the configurations that you will do when you are creating your forms really don't require uh, any formulas um, or any coding. It's a lot of clicking, a lot of configuring, uh, a little bit of typing, but it's, it's, it's definitely very intuitive. Um, but there is the capacity to do some more complex stuff uh, using some formulas if you needed to, um, more for the developer level uh, kind of complexities. Now, um, when you're using Nintex forms with SharePoint, it's just going to be utilizing the permissions from, uh, from SharePoint. So, you know, there's not like separate um, different licenses that you need to worry about. Um, but when you use Nintex Workflow Cloud, you can actually set it so that you have forms that are you know, available to the, to the whole public um, in general, as long as they have the URL, or you can limit it to just members of your organization. Um, and the, the forms, one of the big differences, I think Nintex forms is really more geared towards uh, working around individual list items uh, rather than creating the full-blown app functionality. Okay, now I'm just gonna take a quick look 
some of the just the very simple, you know, low level things that that you might do um, with with forms and uh, with UIs in general, and then we can kind of get the idea. The goal is to kind of get an idea of how these um, the tools are are used, and you can kind of see the the way that. Uh, they use, like, for example, formulas as opposed to just configurations, and you can get the general idea. Now, again, when you're working, uh, we're going to kind of do this demo out of uh, SharePoint Online because I think this is where, or just SharePoint General, because this is where a lot of people are going to be um, coming in um, to be working from here. Okay, yes, and so I, I did forget uh, to mention this at the beginning. Please go ahead and post any questions that you have uh, into the chat. Um, or you know any other uh, conversations you may have, and I'll try to get to them uh, during the presentation. If not, you know we'll see if we have time for a Q and A uh, later towards the end. Or if we even don't have time to get to them, I will definitely um, come around and answer them. You know we'll try to maybe be able to get a kind of conversation thread going around this. Um, and I think I can answer this question real quick. Uh, Rishi's asking, what's the difference between Nintex Workflow Cloud and Nintex on premises? So when you talk about Nintex on-premise, it's based on SharePoint on-premise. So you've got your, your Nintex workflow is installed on, on your, your servers on-premise, obviously, but Nintex workflow cloud is completely based in the cloud. You can think of it as just a workflow engine that is going to run with uh, any of the other applications that it has connectors to. So you can have your, your start trigger be from, let's say, uh, a document is, is added in Box or a record is updated in Salesforce. Like you can have triggers that can be from uh, one of the many different uh, connectors that they have. Um, I can't modify this start event, but you can see they've got tons of connectors, Dynamics, Google Drive, Box, you know, OneDrive, even uh, SQL and Teams, Slack, ServiceNow. So you can have, you know, something that triggers a workflow from an, any of these external systems and then as it goes along the way you know you can see in the, the sample right here that we've got connectors to other things right we're going to create a record in Salesforce and we create a, a folder in box and maybe you're going to grab a document from a file from one system and upload it to another uh, whereas with Nintex uh, on premises you're um, going to be based starting with a list item uh, or a document in SharePoint so if you remember all your SharePoint workflows normally it's triggered by hey, someone creates a new item or an item is modified in some way and you would have some sort of um, uh, conditions like, oh yeah, somebody modified this item. If they change this status field, we're gonna run this workflow. Um, in Nintex Workflow Cloud, your trigger can be some, some other system or you can have your own form that you create in Workflow Cloud and that form isn't necessarily tied to a SharePoint. That's the big difference, right? It's, it's all about SharePoint or just, you know, uh, the cloud, Nintex Workflow Cloud, this, this data is stored in Nintex Workflow Cloud, not in a list item uh, somewhere else. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. But you are still able to get all that data from the form um, in, in Workflow Cloud, and you can do whatever you want with it. I mean, throughout the life cycle of this workflow, we've got all the information captured in that form, and you know, you can reach out to different systems, you can do whatever, um, whatever you need to do, a workflow based. Okay, so coming back, uh, I know we're still kind of in, in the apps and UI portion of this. If we, you know, look at just an old uh, SharePoint list, right? I created a, a list here for a leave request, probably should have been called travel request. But we've got we've got a few columns, uh, just some text, some dates, you know, like yes or no, you know, drop down, stuff like that. Now, if you're familiar, obviously, with um, classic SharePoint, you know, not classic, but uh, just out of the box SharePoint form, it gives you some, uh, it gives you all the fields that you created there. And then you'll see your option to customize this with Power Apps. Now I feel like, you know, a lot of times this is the good introduction into Power Apps, but by no means is this the full limitation of that, but that's what we'll start with right now. So if I clicked on customize with Power Apps, you know, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna see the form as they have it here, and then you'll have the ability to customize it uh, in however you want. Um, now, Power Apps is really is really powerful. You can create a lot of what they call screens, and each screen might just be, you know, a different. Um, I don't want to call it a form because there's much more that you can do with your screens. You can have um, lists of, of of data on there. You know, you can have basically just whatever you want. It's it's a very very powerful tool. Um, 
but it's not always the most intuitive when you're when you're trying to you know i think there's a much steeper learning curve and i think this is one of the big differences uh between the power platform and an in-text platform it's just like the the learning curve and the complexity of trying to um, make modifications like for example you know even just hey i just want to move some stuff around on my form and i think people will feel this frustration the first time you know there yes you can kind of move a box around within within this you know, card, but if I want to move the card around, you, you can't just drag and drop it around. You know, you have to realize that, okay, we're going to go to this particular the form. Uh, I wanted to put the date next to the other date. It's, it's again, just going to this form and, okay, well, we have to put two columns there. And now if I want this date next to this one, then we have to um, change the, uh, the, the, you know, the order of the fields. Let's put that date, let's, let's put the department up there. And then it's kind of, you know, move stuff around that way. So, I mean, it's it definitely um, easy. There is some dragging and dropping to do, but not exactly uh, the most uh, easy to figure out right away. Now, one of the things you'll notice when you're working on in, in Power Apps is, again, the, the function bar. And there's a lot of things that you can do here. And it, it, you know, it gives you basically a lot of the um, ways to control uh, properties um, and, and kind of create rules and, and define actions and stuff like that. And sometimes it just shows you, you know, just uh, hard-coded numbers. Um, but this is where a lot of the magic happens, you know, with uh, with Power Apps. But again, it is a, a function-based um, function-based control, and you have to know, you know, a lot about these functions in order to make it do the things that you want. Um, so that is not always something that. Uh, people are going to know out of the box. There's definitely a much steeper learning curve in, in figuring out the functions um, than what I'll show you, you know, in the Nintex form. But if you have that experience, you know, there is a lot that you can do with it. Now, one other thing that we were just going to look at just to, I mean, okay, obviously you can look at your uh, properties and make, you know, kind of the basic changes pretty easily. Um, but now when you start looking at some of the, you know, the, the advanced properties, this is where you're really going to start seeing uh, some of the more, I know this control doesn't have a whole lot, but some of the more uh, kind of developer um, looking uh, values in here, right? You know, a lot of the something dot something that I talked about. Um, and this can be a lot more complicated. Uh, for example, you know, we wanted to create a, a simple rule where if this, this billable is, is turned on, then we are going to hide uh, the reason. The reason box. I, I had already done this before, but it's just you know to be able to do that. There's there's not a very simple way to say, hey, I just want to create a rule somewhere that if this thing is checked, that this thing is going to now be you know not visible. And so you know we're playing around with it for a little bit, and it just come down to having the control. I mean, again, you can kind of see when you look at this control that we're looking at how things can be very much, it looks like what you would expect if you're a developer. Like I, I, this looks familiar to me, you know, working through Visual Studio and stuff and not always what people are gonna understand if they're the citizen developer. So they like to advertise low code or no code, but you know, I, I don't think there's, a, there's, there's any real such thing. There is definitely um, a level of um, experience required to work with this. Um, and so it ended up being that, you know, we can take the, the visibility property and set it to equal the value of the billable uh, control itself. And that way, whether it's set to true or false is actually going to, you know, be whether that is visible or not. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into this. I, I think the main point is that, you know, Power Apps is an extremely, extremely powerful tool. A ton of things you can do, it, it, you know, could, connects to all sorts of external systems, can display. Um, list views of stuff you, you can even have the you know the templates out where you get the search box already to kind of fill, search through things in sharepoint but you need to know a lot more what you're doing and you got to have a lot of experience with you know some functions and formulas and stuff like that now kind of on the similar uh, side we we want to look at our go over here to just kind of a, an in-text version of stuff Okay, the same same kind of form, you know, you, you have the option to create an in-text form. And then we open that up, you're just going to see, um, you can open it in the, uh, there's a classic designer, but there's the new uh, responsive designer. Um, and over here, you can see the controls that you can add, and it's very, 
I think a lot more intuitive for people if you want to just drag a, a control and put it on there and have a new date time field or let's say let's put it next to this one and let's have three levels of dates you know kind of right next to each other um, definitely a lot more uh, for you know things that your your power users can do I mean you don't have to be kind of a, a developer to do this um, and you can see all the, the forms from your from your SharePoint already right but this is the one that's tied into SharePoint and again this is a one of the differences if you're working with workflow cloud obviously you're not talking about uh, SharePoint columns here but you know you have connectors and you can drop your controls in that you want and you can populate them from from data from other um, other connections and stuff like that so now when you click on one of your controls you have your properties for each control right this is our, our leave and start date you know you can change things like okay this is this is a date control you can see which field it's actually connected to from our sharepoint columns uh, i want to hide the time yes because this is only a date field uh, you can have kind of some validation you know default values whether it's required or not and you can kind of see um how the, the visual differences with this interface is compared to the power apps it's just a, a different sort of interface you don't need to kind of you know feel like you have that I think without so much of a development uh, background, you can really kind of see what's going on, um, I think a little more intuitively. Uh, okay, and even with, let's say this rule that we were talking about, um, let's see, we're gonna look around here at our designer and say, okay, well, you know, here's some rules. Let's create kind of a rule for, one of the rules for this form and let's say, hide reason if, Billable, right? If you can bill it to someone else, we don't need a reason. We're billing it to someone else. So, uh, if, right? There's all of our fields here. Billable is no, is yes. Then reason. Let's see. Visible is no. Create that rule, right? Um, and you know you could create a bunch of these these rules can be copied and modified as you will I mean, this is kind of how you're creating your, your dynamic form here uh one other thing that i wanted to kind of do a quick comparison on i mean these are uh, i would say that each platform has a very different uh way of doing this but different also capabilities like we talked about these multiple screens um in power apps and I do like the power app screens because they're, they're, like I said, really powerful. One screen could be a list of all of the, let's say, requests. You click on one, it will take you to another screen, which is just that individual request form. Those are called screens. It takes a lot of configuring and setting up, but once you got it, um, it's there. But one thing Nintex does really well with their forms and designers, you can create uh, forms that you use multiple um, screens and they're, they're kind of known as um, uh, pages. So if I was working on my form here and I wanted to have um, multiple pages, like a, a form that kind of flows like a, uh, how do you call it, kind of like a wizard, um, you could just create multiple pages uh, really easily and just and go through them uh, one at a time so that, uh, you know, you have this section to, to fill out and then right there we configure pages. So page one might just be, you know, uh, request details and then the next page may be you know uh, travel information and then the next page may be uh, uh, manager signature right and so you this is the first part of the form and when the user is done with that they click on the next button and it would take them to the second page which may have you know its own set of different uh, form options on it how much is your travel going to cost you know what, what day are you planning to go and then the next one would take them to the manager signature where maybe we'd want to have you know kind of manager signature something that they can draw on anyway when the, when you know when you when you're looking at these um, pages in a form this is and you see you get a lot of your validation here um, oops I should probably make that editable uh, but then you can just kind of push through the three different uh, of pages in in your form and it's really easy to create that i mean you know there, there's there's no code required it's all just configuration so i think this is one of the the bigger difference we want to highlight here is just what it seems like the um the level of complexity to create some pretty um nice looking things 
Uh, I think at the end of the day with Power Apps, you could do a lot more, but you have to have a high level of developer experience. Whereas with Intex, you can do a lot, um, but you don't even need to have, you know, almost anybody can do a whole lot with it without that much experience. So. Uh, Rish is asking if we can call an in-text workflow. Okay, uh, I'll answer that question in just a minute. We're going to get into the, kind of the workflow stuff here. Uh, you know, if you have any questions kind of with, related to, you know, this is the, like I said, the user interface uh, differences, then um, go ahead and po post them in the chat and we'll try to get to that. Okay. <clears throat> now let's get into flows or power automate as they call it and <laughs> in-text workflows. Uh, I just made these uh, very, very few bullet points here so we can talk a little bit uh, more about it, you know, with the, with the visual. Um, but again, these are both cloud-based environments that are designer. You're either using your Power or your Flows, um, uh, Microsoft Flow, Power Automate page where you can, you know, manage all of your flows there or you're using uh, Nintext um, Workflow Cloud or Workflow for SharePoint. Uh, both of them connect to um, numerous different external systems, right? They all have connectors. Uh, which is great, and they can all both be triggered by external applications um, activities, which means you're not, you know, tied to something that's just in SharePoint like we kind of used to back then, or to any one single uh, application at that. Now, some of the just the differences that we might see, uh, one of them is just the, the data storage. Um, I know Power Automate, when you have your tasks, you know, a big part of workflows is this tasks, whether it's approval task or whether it, it's something else. So um, when you're working with Power Automate, your tasks are not stored in SharePoint, even though you create this approval task. It's uh, stored in the common data services as part of the you know Power Platform. Uh, so you're not just going to go to SharePoint and throw a web part on the review of your task list for people to see. Um, whereas with Nintex, if it's one of the Nintex uh, SharePoint versions, such as uh, um, you know on-prem or SharePoint Online, you know they're stored in in a task list which you might be familiar with if you've ever used that before. And it's, you know, just like another SharePoint uh, um, list. And you get all of that functionality that you normally get with data lists in SharePoint. Or if you're using Nintex Workflow Cloud, you know, these tasks are stored in Nintex Workflow Cloud. And I'll kind of show you what that looks like later. Um, Power Automate, again, they use these Excel style formulas um, to do a lot of the more complex behaviors. I mean, it does have, its it's it's also a very much a, uh, click and configure um, interface, but um, there's again more of this. You can do a lot more, but you have to kind of know a lot more in order to do it. Uh, and then workflows again, kind of really brings that whole just click and configure um, method to it, uh, and we'll see that here in a little bit. Um, I think one of the I don't want to say it's a downside because it really takes a lot of of usage to get to this point, but just know that if, if you're working on trying to create some giant massive applications, there are instances where uh, you might hit some some throttling if you actually have, you know, exceed some usage limits at Power Automate. Again, this is only really matters if you're doing massive um, amounts of um, runs. Uh, with Nintex workflows, they don't they don't have any throttling. There's unlimited user interactions and unlimited is instances to be that can be created. Uh, you kind of pay in a per workflow basis. Okay, we'll do a live demo. Okay, she did have a question. Are there any differences in the designer for an in-text workflow cloud versus on-premise? Yes, uh, there are different. Um, there are some differences in there. I mean, even with the the forms and with the workflows, there are different options that that you get whether you're doing a workflow cloud on on-premise. Obviously, when you're working um, with anything that's on-premises, you have a lot more uh, capabilities just because you know you're able to install stuff on your own your own servers. And it has access to a lot more of the, you know, local um, APIs and resources. Uh, so as compared to when you're working in the cloud, and obviously, you know, you're working with shared resources, and you can't do any really uh, local level stuff. So let's get back into our examples here. And <clears throat> okay, so if you want to create flows. Um, it still says flow, but yeah, uh, using Power Automate, there are a number of ways to go about it. Normally, if you want to start from your SharePoint list, 
And again, I'm just going to reiterate here that none of these uh, systems, both of them can be, you know, not dependent on the SharePoint list, but this is just the, where we're going to start a demo at. And it is nice with flows that you can start from a template. And they, they always show you, you know, some of the templates you can get here, like start an approval um, when a new item is added. So this is a very nice feature of flows is the fact that, the, that they'll give you a template um, that... Uh, already kind of built some of the scaffolding for you, which can be good, or, or sometimes it, it is kind of, you know, not always great because you have to uh, delete and reconfigure some stuff. But for a lot of people who are just starting out, it is a good way uh, to get going. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, it tells you about the connectors that you want. And obviously, you know, this is kind of the same through with, with all systems. When you're talking about connectors, obviously you got to configure them to have you know, whatever credentials you may need or whatever you know, URLs you will need to, to, to access um, the different uh, services. In this case, this is all local within Office 365 using the same credential that's not, uh, not that uh, complex here. And so you can see here, I mean, this is a, a template that's already kind of built out. Okay, new items is created. Uh, it, it populates this stuff from the, the SharePoint list from, you know, for you. You got the site address and the list name, and it starts its approval, and um, it kind of builds out it's kind of the basic scaffolding of, a, of an approval process for you, right? Condition is response is equal to approve. We can send an email here. We can send an email there. So very powerful, very general workflow stuff. Um, you get this visual designer. Uh, things, one of the things that... I don't know, kind of a, um, is a little bit more troublesome is every time you, this was coming from a template, if you were uh, doing something uh, from scratch, um, even though you, you know, you know it should be tied to the SharePoint list, every time you, you want an action that's based on, you know, something in the SharePoint, this very particular SharePoint list, you kind of have to specify again this site and this list um, for it to know instead of it just knowing always that uh, what it's working with. But again, it's a very, very easy to use uh, configuration. If you look at the, the way it is, I mean, this is, okay, we're starting an approval. Here's the title of the approval process. You can have some dynamic content. The dynamic content is things that, you know, it can pull from uh, other steps along the workflow. So as you can see, this is, you know, this SharePoint step here was from earlier in the workflow. Uh, if you want uh, properties from that, that step here, whether it's, pull the document or it got a, a list item or something like that. You can add that on here. Now, some of these though, when you are configuring these, uh, these values, it gets really, again, you have to use uh, formulas um, to do that. And I think a good example of that, uh, one thing that they got a kind of a negative strike in my mark is just the conditional starting, conditional triggers. Um, you'll see how the formulas have to act here. Uh, if I wanted to change this trigger to work, not just when an item is created, but when an item is modified and a certain uh, value uh, has been has been changed, <clears throat> and we would let's start by deleting this trigger. Oops. Okay, I'm not searching for actions. Let's just delete this trigger. Okay. And we'll start with a with a new one. When a SharePoint, when an item is created or modified, okay, this is the trigger that starts the workflow. Um, now, the only issue here, and see here, even though I, I thought I was working with this SharePoint list item, uh, very particular, I would still have to, you know, uh, find it and and again choose my list. Not the end of the world. Just one of these little things that can annoy you after a while. But now, this was a, a limitation. Is is how do we have this start only when a certain property is a certain value? I don't want this flow to run every single time this item is modified. Um, they have just added this as, as newer functionality, and I don't think it's fully baked yet, but if you go to your settings, uh, trigger conditions can be, one or more expressions must be true for this trigger to fire. And this is a kind of an unfortunate thing is that what, what, what is the condition? You know, please fill out this field. There's absolutely nothing to tell you what to do here. And, you know, when you do a little bit of research, you'll realize that you have to have some sort of, you know, formula in there. Um, I believe it's something like, um, say, billable. Mm, true, something like that. I'm sorry, this formula is 
terrible, but it, it's something like that. But there's not even you know any way to, uh, to to see it or test it or even know that it's valid. You just got to throw that trigger condition in there um, and know how to work with formulas. And again, this is what a lot of the things that you'll see around here are. Like you'll see this you know at sign and then you know kind of the the bigger container that you're working with and then you know a lot of parentheses, a lot of dots and the, the notations of just um you know brackets and it's, I, mean, I don't know it's it's not something that you would necessarily say your uh everyday power users or even the more technical ones are going to be um very easily able to work with okay and you'll see you know again here's the the formulas you can do if you don't want to just use dynamic content if you want something that's a little bit more um complex of course you know you have you can have formulas and i mean a lot of these are familiar to a lot of people and you're like yeah okay that's not you know the most uh um complex thing ever but it's definitely uh, a notation that you have to be uh, experienced with to use when you're going to get um when you're going to get a little more uh, complex with your workflows right like that's how you know okay body and action name this is shorthand for you know all your actions i mean you got to know what is what this means and that learning curve is again a little bit steeper to do sometimes what seems like really basic actions especially if you're going to get into looping especially if you're going to get into you know some of that conditional um, looping and you need to be able to find okay i'm in this loop and i need to only work with the current item um, this is all done through through formulas and getting the property of one item that you're working with and you're looping you'll, you'll realize that it's something that, that takes a little bit of time to learn and get used to. Now, um, when we're looking at uh, Nintex workflows, um, you'll see all of your different uh, items here. Actually, let me go from our, from our SharePoint site. That was Workflow Cloud. I mean, the, the designers look almost um, identical. There's just some different actions that you may or may not see in one. Okay, um, I was just looking at this uh, question that Alex had about uh, migrating on-premise forms and workflows into an Office 365 tenant. Uh, I see your response in there, Ben. Yeah, and right now there there is, um, all right, like I said, once the, the new responsive forms are, are all around or your forms are on there, it'll be a lot easier to migrate. But if you're using kind of, you know, the more classic designer um, on on-premise or even in, um, uh, for Office 365, you know, you can use a classic designer, which is a little bit different from that uh, form designer that I was showing you. Uh, it's still possible to uh, migrate it into the classic stuff. There is just some work to be done. And, you know, partners like us, we work on some of these as well. And a lot of times that's just like kind of making sure that the way the form migrated over um, is, is correct. And you have to just it can, kind of get like 80% of the way there. Then you just have to do the rest. Anyway, uh, things to do on this form. Okay, let's just see. Here's all the items that you, or actions that you can do. Uh, you know, you want to check in an item, you, you just drag and drop it into there. Um, and then it's it's a configuration. Um, if you're working with a current item, I mean, you can see that, actually, this is a bad one because it's checking in some other item. So let's delete that. But, I mean, all of your actions are, are exist here and they can very easily drag and drop them into into your workflow uh, and then you just it's just a matter of configuration which is a i think a lot less complex because you don't have to work with those same sort of formulas that you do in flows now one thing i want to show you here is this is the conditional workflow start which i think is is a big win um on the nintex side here so they can improve that in uh in in, in flows for example start when items are modified and then you can add the condition i want to make sure that you know the approval status is is equal to you know uh now this is a out of the box sharepoint one but if we had uh reason right you can see it even it even has the values from a drop down so we're only going to start this if it's a if it's a medical reason then you're, you know then you're going to start that workflow you can have multiple conditions with ands or ors and you can even add conditions um when items are created so, uh, you know, I'm looking like we're, time is going to get a little bit tight here. So let me just kind of get back maybe to the presentation because there's a lot more things that I need to go to um, get into. Um, 
But uh, Nitsec's workflow, I mean, they, they have a lot of in integrations with the external services, as, as do Power Apps as well. Uh, but I think a big part of what we're going to discuss next is um, how those uh, integrations, if they're going to cost you or not with your licensing model. So, sorry, we got to kind of get through this one, but I think we need to get through some of these slides here a little quicker. Okay, licensing and costs. Um, by the way, just to wrap up that section, it's very similar to what we we're looking at in, in Power Apps and and uh, and um, Forms. I think the level of, of complexity, you can do a lot of stuff with, with Nintex with a lot less of the developer level experience. But with flows, you know, you have a lot of control over almost every single property, but most of that stuff you probably wouldn't need. Um, and you don't not going to be able to do it unless you know how to write some pretty complex formulas anyway. So licensing and questions or and costs. So true or false, Power Apps and Power Automate are included free with my Office 365 subscription. This is half true, half false. It is true, you do get a, a Power App and Flow license, but there are some limitations. So if you have any one of these license types, you know, you were, it includes uh, Power Apps. But the main limitation is that you can only use the standard connectors. Like you can't have any custom or premium uh, connectors, which is a lot of the, you know, the, the standard connectors give you almost all of the Office 365 functionality. They include some very basic ones like Twitter and Facebook, uh, you know, some of the really common social media uh, connectors. But anytime you're going to kind of get a little bit of, uh, of muscle behind it, uh, use any of the kind of the Azure um connectors and they took those out of standard now and they're in the premium uh sql mysql or oracle uh if you want an on-premise gateway to connect to your you know on-premise sharepoint or anything that you have on-premise on uh this is not included with standard um you can't have your model driven app model driven apps you can't use a common data service uh which is kind of you know i don't know if you're familiar with that but it, it's how you can create entities and store data and it, it makes a lot of things easier uh, for the development side, but it's not available in the, the free version. Uh, you don't get the Power Apps Portal, which is more for the standalone um, standalone version of Power Apps, and you also get 2,000 uh, only API calls a day uh, per user. And where they're going with this is Power Apps and Power Automate have they've created this new uh, pricing model where it can be standalone, where it doesn't tie into your Office 365. So instead of having to, you know, use anything Office 365, you can use a Power Apps portal. You can just create these Canvas apps and, and have them live in this portal where they can just kind of, you know, be like their own websites, kind of, right? Web applications, they can be mo uh, mobile on phones or tablets, uh, but it doesn't re need to rely on Office 365. But then you're paying for, um, you're, you're paying for it. <laughs> and the, with Power Apps, it's a $10 per user per app per month or $40 for unlimited apps for each user. So uh, I'm going to do a quick example of how this can really, you know, blow up exponentially and your cost wise, you know, if you just wanted one app with, a, you know, 100 people that would, could use it, that's just even access it and use it, you know, you're already looking like $1,000 um, per month or is that $10,000 per month, if you're, no, $100,000 per month just for one app with 100 people using it. And that's not even with, you know, a flow um, running behind it. So if you wanted to have flows, again, that aren't just tied in, limited to your Office 365, you're going to kind of be paying uh, for, for it with either unlimited flows per user or basically the, this other model is kind of you get five flows, you're basically paying $100 for each flow, um, and that's with unlimited users. And then after the first five, you can get additional flows for $100 a month. Um, Nitsex workflows and forms, the way their licensing worked, I mean, there, there are many different, uh, you know, tiers, obviously, but just kind of put apples to apples starting on a basic level with 10 workflows. Um, they have a standard edition and enterprise edition. Most of the time, you're probably going to want to do enterprise edition. You know, standard uh, has a lot of similar functionalities, but also um, some limitations, like you don't have, the, you know, AD connectors and stuff. So for just to keep things more apples to apples, we'll talk about Enterprise Edition. In 10 workflows, $15,000 a year. This is at the kind of the entry level. And then obviously the more workflows you get, um, there, there are some more discounts included. But this includes 50 forms. You're not paying separately for forms, like how Power Apps and, uh, and Automate are kind of, you know, two different things that you pay for. So each workflow, you kind of get five, uh, five different forms that you can customize for each workflow. Uh, this also includes some document generation activities. They do have a workflow step for DocGen, which is really nice. 
uh, and it has all the connectors um, that you could need, and you can even develop custom ones. So there's not this standard and premium version. Uh, well, no, the standard enterprise, but it's not like um, uh, with Power Apps where there's the standard and premium where you're going to pay for one and the other one's free. Uh, so enterprise is kind of the one we're going to compare with. So we did have um, a use case that we kind of wanted to review, and this was based on a you know based on a real life uh, scenario. I just kind of stripped out all names and stuff. Uh, we were um, kind of doing an analysis to create a big system for a, um, a company, actually the city that, that wanted to manage some inventory, and it basically they needed a big system to track thousands of, of vehicles would be used by hundreds of users and there's a lot of different parts to it you know workflows for approvals of this request purchases maintenance um, and needed to connect to external systems so once we get into that now we're already knowing that we're using you know even though they're using SharePoint online this connectivity to external systems to get data is now made at a premium of uh, and also enterprise if we're talking in text right at the end of the day there are going to be 10 complex workflows you know a few dozen individual forms, you needed to access Active Directory, you needed to access the third-party connectors, and we needed some Azure functions as well. And so in this scenario, we were talking about, you know, we'd have to pay for the Power Apps and Power Automate, and we would want an enterprise workflow from Nintex with at least the 10 workflows. Um, Nintex side, pretty straightforward. 10 workflows, 15K a year, that included all the enough forms that we have, it was, you know, 15K for the year. Now, with, with Power Apps, Power Automate, this one was kind of, you know, really, it, got a, it blew up. It got a little crazy with this new pricing model they did. Okay, 10 flows. You got your five for 500 uh, per month, and then we add another five to that. So we'd have, you know, th basically $1,000 per, per month, so 12000 a year for those 10 flows. If we, we were able to condense it down to so say, hey, we can just really have five apps here um, that are going to be, that we're going to use, uh, we'll just, you know, add as much to each app as we can because but they're since they're separate different things uh, we'll just use five of them and but if you need hundreds of users let's just simplify it down to 100 users if we're doing this $40 per user per month plan um, that's you know four thousand dollars a month just for the apps part of it which is coming out to you know about 48k a year so then we're looking at like sixty thousand dollars a year so this is one scenario where you know it would really you can see how Power Apps and Power Automate, if you're getting out of the Office 365 space using custom connectors, it can get um, really expensive real quick. So it's definitely one of the things that you want to um, consider uh, when you're doing um, uh, comparisons for, for this. But some people still use it anyway. Uh, one of the projects that we do it now for a uh, big um, retail market uh, grocery store company, and it's, it's really, really, really expensive. <laughs> they choose to go the Power Apps way. Although I'm sure Microsoft gives them some deal on it, it's it's just kind of unbelievable. So anyway, based on some real life scenarios, you know, like I said, we are uh, a big Microsoft partner. We use Power Apps, Power Automate all the time, um, and sometimes we use them in big situations, and sometimes we use them, you know, like I said, a big application, or, or we use them pretty regularly in some of our projects when it's just Office 365 based. But for most companies. You know, I would probably recommend using Power Apps and Flows if you either if you don't have developers on staff, you obviously don't want to get you know super complex with your apps. You can build simple ones, um, do a little bit of research, get over that learning curve, you know, or you can just modify your SharePoint list forms. And uh, you, there are some templates you can use, like you know, one one way with your SharePoint list, it gives you already kind of a search bar at the top of the app, and it, it's connected to your SharePoint list. So when somebody using the app can just search bring up the list item and then go to a different screen, which is the edit form, right? This is pretty simple to do. But once you get anything more than that, you, you know, you're really going to get into higher complexity levels. But now if you have developers or you're working with consultants, you know, you can create really complex apps and really powerful stuff, but just beware of, you know, the cost implications when, you, when you're getting it into that. Um, I recommend using it. Obviously, if you're not using premium connectors, because then, then you're going to start to pay per person per user or per user per, per month, which is expensive. Or if you're staying within the Office 365 environment, you know, by all means, this is you know, great use of that. One example is uh, a lot of our work, sorry, this is a hastily um, scrubbed out uh, image here. Uh, we do a lot of migration projects, and in our migration projects, you know, we may have UAT on these, you know, dozens or hundreds of sites that we do. We create a Pyro app that's tied to a SharePoint library, um, and users are listed as the UAT testers. They can go into the app. They can see their sites that they're assigned to. They can click on the arrow and go to a place where they can enter their own issues. You know, 
nice powerful stuff you can do with Power Apps. Um, this is all free because we're keeping it contained within O365. But mind you, we have a lot of very strong developers on our team. So again, not the, something that any you know um, power user would just go and probably do. Uh, so when's a good time to use Nintex forms and workflows? Okay, if you don't have developers, but you want to build applications that look good and are strong enough for kind of enterprise level uh, apps, uh, I think it's a very good, uh, very great use case there, just because of the fact that you know it, it, it looks it looks like it's it's very professional, you know, very nice, responsive stuff. You can control a lot of things without having to be a developer. Uh, if you want to build a lot of apps um, with without having a whole bunch of developers or teams, and you want to kind of you know you get them out quickly, that's the, let this citizen developer thing happen. Let people in each department who have some experience can use this tool. You can build a lot uh, in a relatively quick amount of time. So I say complex forms and workflow, but that's because as you saw, you know these these citizen developers can actually build more complex stuff than I believe they probably could with Power Apps. Um, I threw this one in there, DocGen, because of the fact that it comes with it, and you know it's maybe not really within the span of the scope of this this presentation, but it's it's a big thing that you can look into, and a, a lot of workflows you know require document generation, and it, if it's part of your package, then you might as well. Um, it definitely is a selling point for the Nintex side. Uh, just kind of showing you some of the workflows um, uh, that we worked on with, with with other clients. You know, you create beautiful forms and stuff, and workflows that just reach out, connect to many sort of systems uh, without having to be, you know, a, a really um, experienced developer. So Rachel's asking if I can clarify pricing again. If I created a flow, it costs each time it is. No, it does not cost you each time the flow is used. You can have uh, unlimited or not unlimited. Um, you, I don't want to say unlimited, but no, it doesn't cost you per run on a flow, but it does count against your kind of API call limit. So, you know, you can't have a flow that's just triggering every every second of the day and it's running thousands of times, you know, it'll just get throttled, but it's not going to cost you more. So what you're paying for is per flow. So if you're talking about, um, are you talking about Nintex or are you are talking about Power Apps? I mean, we can share, I think, this deck out later. I have resources. Okay, Power Apps. Yeah, in Power Apps, you you pay you have five flows for five hundred dollars, and that's uh, unlimited amount of users. So you're just paying five hundred dollars a month, and they can run that flow as many times as they want, with a throttling exception after a while. <laughs> um, I threw this side in there because I want you to know that Power Apps can be complex. I'm, I'm pushing this. Yes, you can build you know massive applications with it, but just know that you're gonna have to have a high level of experience and I threw this slide in. No such thing as low code, no code. I mean, this is one of the formulas. Uh, on this app that uh, that we're building, and it's just to kind of set some, you know, um, hide some some elements based on the security group you were in. But if you look at this formula, like, oh man, you know, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, it's it can get pretty hairy uh, if if you're trying to get uh, do some really complex stuff with it. Okay, come on, curtains, move on over. Okay, uh, last but not least, though, you know, this they, they can all live in harmony. They're, you don't have to just say, hey, we're only doing one or the other. But just remember that you got to have support for both. Um, one nice thing about Nintex is that, you know, we are partners, and if you subscribe or purchase through partners like us, I mean, it costs the same. There's, you know, as if you went to Nintex and said it, get it directly. It always costs the same, but we offer the first level of support and professional services. Um, so a lot of our customers come to us, ask questions, or we sit down and work with them to go through best practices, review their, their stuff, you know, and they can pick up the phone or shoot an email out. And you actually have a first level of support uh, sometimes uh, before you have to go, normally we work together with Nintex's support team as well. So uh, you don't necessarily get that when you're using free version of, of Power Platform, although I know when you are using the paid one, they do have, um, you know, support services that you can call. But um, I think partners are really good for that. Um, I've seen them both work together in Harmony, and we do this too, where we use uh, you know Power Apps to control some of the uh, uh, UI, but then you have uh, Nintex workflows you know running in the back end. So I mean, they can both work together. You just gotta you gotta have support for both of them. Um, all right, or use Power Apps for the free stuff, you know, when it and it stays within Office 365, and Nintex for some of the more complex things. Now. I wanted to take a really quick moment because one thing I talked about before is the bigger picture. If you, you know, what is your consideration for these workflows or apps you're creating as far as the bigger picture of your process 
management within your company. Uh, workflows are processes, right? You got you got forms, you got you got flows, and how do you uh, manage those? The only reason we bring this up is because uh, with Nintex's platform, you know, it not only do they tie into all of these services, but they offer a lot of other products as well, which I think are really cool. Such as uh, ProMap is kind of one of their newest ones, which is a really nice uh, process management visual based process management tool that kind of, you know, you don't have to make your Visio diagrams, you just write out with configuration what your process is like. It draws your swim lane diagram for you with clickable links and there's a ton of things. And then they even have a, a button now for each of these um, processes that you create that you click generate the workflow and it will create the scaffolding of a workflow for you. So uh, between their forms and uh, workflow automation and then, you know, document management and the e-signatures, which is a non-text sign product and ProMap for actually having an interface for managing, searching um, and kind of keeping track and providing, you know, getting feedback on all your processes from users and then things like robotic process automation of Foxtrot. Uh, they do have a nice suite of products that really work together to complete the whole um, kind of business process uh, management side of the house. Uh, so we're just kind of throwing that in there just to know. I mean, that's is another thing that's kind of lacking um, in the Power Apps and, and Flows. You know, they do great on their own thing, but they, again, just kind of stand alone. Uh, there's not much else uh, that, that works around with them. So uh, let me see, can we have a download with a copy of your presentation and slide deck? Yes, uh, we will um, get that out to you guys. Uh, we have everybody's contact information, so what we'll probably do is put it on a share somewhere and then email you guys the link. Uh, so I know, I'm, I'm sorry, I kind of had to, to plow through this really quickly at the end because I realized that we were kind of going over a little over on time. But what we would like to do is invite everybody to, um, you know, e email Jeremy. He's a... Uh, uh, one of our um, main account managers over here and that will be any of you know set, shoot us an email uh, and we can set up a time where we can actually have a discussion you know with, with myself uh, netwoven and to one of the guys from Nintex I know we got you know will and Nick out here some of our good friends and we can kind of uh, uh, we'd be happy to sit down and and talk to you guys uh, anybody about just kind of where where you are at in your uh, whether the you know the workflows, if you have questions you know about any of the things we discussed here, or just anything about Nintex or Power Apps in general, um, yeah, reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to have a, a more in-depth, personal discussion and just kind of see you know um, where you can go from there. Um, I'll leave this one up. I mean, the next slide you'll have this obviously when you uh, um, get the deck, but it's just got links to the licensing guide for Power Apps and Power Automate. Uh, I'll just show you that real quick. Um, a link to set up a Nintex trial. I mean, if you, you know, reach out to us, we'll get the trial set up for you and kind of help you out in the first steps. Uh, we do kind of these, um, when you go through Nintex with us, we do some of the, uh, provide some services for free to get you up and running. Generally, we want to see people have one workflow and form already set up, you know, within like, let's say the first month or so after they purchase so that their ROI is almost immediate. Um, and we also do health checks kind of every six months or so with our customers to make sure that they're that they're they're doing all right they're getting the most value uh for their investments so i just want to say thank you everybody for being here today and for um hearing me out i hope you learned something um and that this was useful uh, again please send an email to jeremy if you would like to have some any sort of follow-up discussion um, or if you want to get my information, will be um, on the first slide of this deck. Once we share it out, again, an email, you can always just reach out to me as well. Um, and I'd be happy to continue the conversation further. So, thank you very much, everybody.